The mayor of Springfield, Ohio, issued a public plea saying, quote, we need help, not hate. This as former President Donald Trump doubles down on a baseless claim that Haitian immigrants are eating pets. And we're now seeing the real life impact that Trump's words are having on the Haitian community there. On Thursday, Springfield City Hall was forced to close due to a bomb threat. On Friday, elementary schools there were evacuated for a second straight day because of threats. So how did this debunked rumor make its way into Trump's remarks on the debate stage? According to the uh, apolitical fact-checking organization NewsGuard, it appears to have started with a single post on a private Springfield, Ohio Facebook page. And in it, the poster claims their neighbor's daughter's friend's missing cat was found butchered and ready to be eaten by Haitian immigrants. The poster says they've been told that this is also happening to dogs, ducks, and geese. Well, there's more. It's not clear when the post was made, but on September 5th, just days before the presidential debate, it went viral on X. And within days, and without any further proof, Elon Musk and vice presidential candidate Senator J.D. Vance were repeating it. So did other Republican politicians like Senator Ted Cruz and Congressman Jim Jordan and Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Neo-Nazis were also a key driver in amplifying the rumor. For months, hate groups like Blood Tribe have been spreading hateful rhetoric about Haitian immigrants in Springfield. And earlier this summer, they carried rifles and swastikas as they marched through downtown Springfield. And last month, Springfield, Springfield's mayor, rather, had police remove a member of Blood Tribe from a city commission meeting. I've come to bring a word of warning. Stop what you're doing before it's too late. Crime and savagery will only increase with every Haitian you bring in. And with it, I think, I public think frustration you and anger. Me. You sound threatening to me. I'm gonna Based ask, on the comments, if I could tonight, ask the police to go ahead. I'm and sure I don't need to tell you that. It just sound threatening if you go ahead and just peacefully be removed. These people didn't ask for this. And they deserve better than to have to put up with violent and Thank unruly you so outsiders. Much. You're done. Thank you. Five days, that's all it took for a private Facebook post to go from Twitter to former President Donald Trump repeating it on a global stage. Joining me to talk about uh, this and other developments, uh, Larry Sabato. He is the founder and director of the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia, and he is the editor of the book, A Return to Normalcy, the 2020 election that almost broke America. Larry, great to see you. Nice to see you, Fred. All right, so I know that was, um, you know, that was quite the journey that a rumor took and has caused significant damage and disruption in that community and beyond in so many ways. So, you know, why does a former president um, keep spewing uh, lies, you know, the, these, this information that is so con continuously to be uh, so damaging? Because it excites his base. Uh, there's no issue like the border for them, uh, even more than inflation. I think uh, the border issue, immigration generally, uh, gets them up and raring to go and determined to reelect Donald Trump. And that is all that matters, frankly, to Donald Trump. Uh, we live partly because of Trump. We live in the post-factual era in which facts no longer matter, Fred. They don't matter. It's whatever you can say, whatever people want to take in, even if you present them with volumes of evidence that it isn't true or it was made up, I'm thinking of the big lie about voter fraud, it's okay because it serves a larger partisan purpose. It supports the candidate they want to win, and uh, the end justifies the means. Boy, uh, we've uh, made a lot of progress in human history, but we haven't made any progress at all. And, and he is also doing it because somehow it is beneficial to him. Um, is that support growing? I don't think it's growing. I think the question is whether or not he can maintain the level of determination and energy that his uh, border police, in a sense, in his coalition, have uh, generated over the years. Because at this point, I don't think it's very likely at all that Donald Trump is going to attract 
new voters, uh, or that he's going to expand his coalition. His chance of being elected again depends entirely on his coalition, his supporters, turning out in very large numbers. And this is what gets their motor running. So, uh, while Trump is also, you know, attacking migrants, immigrants, he's also coming under fire from some of his most staunch supporters uh, for campaigning with far-right conspiracy theorist uh, Laura Loomer. Um, she is someone who has claimed 9-11 was an inside job, posted a racist tweet about Kamala Harris this week. Um, she's been seeing you know, getting on and getting off uh, his plane on his, um, you know, campaign stop. So, uh, and he's he's trying to say, look, he's not necessarily advocating everything that she has to say. She's a strong person. She has her own beliefs. That's the closest he's coming to either condemning or condoning her. Well, he obviously, in maintaining his association with her and including her on his plane, and making public appearances with her has legitimized, at least to a certain degree, I think a substantial degree, the wacky things that she has said over the years. Look, this is not new. Fred, mm -hmm. he has done this since he came on the public scene. He has appeared with far-right conspiratorial people, some of which he has endorsed on first Twitter and then Truth Social. And of course, he has an ally on at least some things with Elon Musk. Uh, you know, if you do it over and over and you pay no penalty for it, and in fact you gain from it politically, uh, if you're like Donald Trump, you're very inclined to do it again and again and again. Okay, meantime, his opponent, Vice President Kamala Harris, she's been campaigning in Republican-leaning counties and battleground states, you know, as she reaches out to swing voters. And she's also launching this campaign to mobilize Latino of uh, voters, uh, what do you make of her strategy and her efforts um, to grow support? This is so important, and Democrats have not done it to the extent they should have for a long time. They ignore the rural areas. And they'll say, well, there are not that many votes there. We're going to go hunting where the ducks are, meaning they want to maximize their vote in suburbs and urban areas. That's fine. Maximize your vote. But you can also help your cause enormously just by showing voters you're interested in what they think and you want to help them with their problems. And when you go into these rural areas, you're not going to win them. As you were saying a few minutes ago, your correspondent was. They're, they're not going to win them. They know they're not going to win them. But what they can do is, instead of losing them by 50 points, they can lose them by 45 points. And you say, well, that's pointless. No, it isn't. When you add up those extra votes, in all those small rural localities, it actually enhances your chances for victory. Larry Sabado, we'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much from the University of Virginia. Thank you, Fred.